Lord, we ask you now to come and to bless our speaker, Brother Jim Sitchko. We ask you to open up his heart uh, to what you want us to hear uh, so he can speak it and that we would be willing and open to hear it. Lord, we ask you also to strengthen and guide us as we live our faith and as we bring uh, this mercy and this love uh, to all we meet. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So Father Jim Sitchko, he grew up in Orange, Texas. I did. Yep. Uh, he majored in vocal performance and opera at the New England Conservatory in Boston, um, the Conservatory of Music in Boston. Uh, maybe you'll sing a little for us maybe. tonight? I maybe think just I will. a little bit, okay. Uh, he was ordained a priest in 1998, so 25 years of priesthood. Yeah, I'm man. 20, I was ordained in 97, so. Oh, 26. Huh? 26 years, yeah. 26 yep. years. Uh, in 2016, Pope Francis uh, commissioned him as one of his papal missionaries of mercy, of which there are about a thousand in the world, but only about a hundred in the United States. Uh, he has a worldwide ministry and a simple mandate from the Pope to go forth and to do good deeds. Um, he's the author of Encountering um, God as a Traveling Papal Missionary of Mercy. You also have a second book, right? To have a, um, what is it, Among Friends, Stories yes. from the Journey. And then a third book coming up by Loyola Press uh, next month, uh, 60 Seconds with Jesus, a meditation on every day. 60 Seconds with, of, Jesus. with Jesus, beautiful. Yeah. I just want to say this. Um, Pope Francis wants these missionaries to be living signs of the Father's readiness to welcome those who want to receive pardon. So he promotes the Sacrament of Reconciliation, but he's also, this is very interesting, Father is able to um, forgive and pardon even those sins that are reserved for the Pope to pardon. So he even has that ability to do that. So it's a beautiful gift that he's here with us tonight. And we just turn this night over to him. And thank you, Father, for being with thank us. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. And you see, I, I want to say to Father, first of all, see, what, I just ran up here. Anytime there's a microphone, anytime there's a pulpit, uh, you know, the, the, the Holy Father challenges us to, to spread the word. Where two or three are gathered in my name, here we are. And how beautiful it is, and I want to thank Father, I want to thank Jack, I want to thank my cousin for, for being here. Um, so, I, I'll... I'll start by saying you are correct. You know, I did my undergraduate work at New England Conservatory of Music in the Juilliard School. Um, and uh, after that, I always wanted to be a priest. So I always wanted to be a priest. When I was a little boy, I remembered I played priest every day. I was so excited when Pringles came out because they would break like, you know, they would. And I only had one parishioner, and the parishioner was my dog, Sheba. No, I'm, I'm being very honest. And then my music took precedence. And I'll never forget that day. I was, it was July 4th with the Boston Pops, Tanglewood, Massachusetts, Lenox, Massachusetts. And I had a voice teacher and a vocal coach. And there's a difference between the two. A voice teacher works on the mechanics of the voice. A vocal coach works on the detailing of the instrument, kind of like a person who details a car. The mechanic works on the inside. And so, I had a wonderful, wonderful vocal coach. She was about 85 at the time, sought after everywhere. Her name was Helen Hodum, 85 years old, always impeccably dressed. Red hair, gray down the middle. And I was so fascinated with her that I would imitate her, not out of rudeness, but out of admiration. She, being a vocal coach, believe it or not, this is how she talked. Hello, honey, how you doing? That's how she talked. 
And she would always hold her hand right here. She had white pearls on. And she'd go, hello, honey, how you doing? And what was so interesting was I would mimic her in affection behind her back. And when people would be introduced to her, they would bust out laughing because I had mimicked her so well. And she would turn to me and she would say, well, honey, why are they laughing? And I would turn to her and i said, say, well, I don't know. Why are they laughing? And she'd say, why are you talking that way? Well, when any of her singers were not performing up to par, she would give a signal and sign. She would grab her pearls. Now, picture this, July 4th, Boston Pops, 10,000 people out on the lawn during a rehearsal for the evening concert. And here I am performing. And I look down, and there she is, <laughs> Mrs. Hodum doing this. And in my mind, I'm trying to think, what am I doing wrong? And I saw her got up from her seat, and she came backstage. She came onto the stage. She quieted the orchestra and Maestro Williams, if you don't know if you've ever heard of John Williams. And she stopped everything. And she came to me and she said, honey, come here. That's what she did in front of everyone. And I just kind of leaned down at her. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, honey, what's wrong? I said, well, what's wrong? She goes, honey, you sound pitiful. That's what she said. And I said, well, I don't want to do this anymore. She said, well, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to do some Brahms? Do you want to do some Mozart? What do you want to do? I said, I want to become a priest. I want to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, offer the sacraments, bring the joy of Jesus. And she said, and I quote, well, honey, go do it and stop wasting my time. And she walked off the stage, and I never saw her again, ever. And then, 25 years ago, ordained a priest, became a pastor of a very large parish, and that's when 11 and a half years, now it's 19 and a half years ago, I received a, a phone call. Well, 11, it was from Pope Francis. I've been a, a missionary. It was, it's eight years. I'm eight years. So about eight and a half years ago, I received a phone call from Pope Francis. Pope Francis is a pope of surprises. My secretary said, the pope's on the phone. I went, right. I picked up the phone, it was Pope Francis, I hung up. <laughs> he called back. And he informed me that he had named me one of 100 priests in the United States, one of now 700 in the world. And then I'll never forget, he brought us all to Rome, all 700 of us from all over the world. We didn't even know anyone, each other. And I had the great opportunity. I was one of the four who was able to stay with the Pope and live with the Pope in the Doma Santa Martha, the house of St. Martha. Pope Francis doesn't live in that big apostolic palace. He lives in this 300-room dormitory called the Doma Santa Martha. <laughs> and... You know, I don't know if any of you follow me on social media, 
But if you follow me on social media, you know one of the things that I love to do, I love it, I'm addicted to it, is that I love taking selfies. I just love it. I was just up with His Eminence, Cardinal Maida. The first thing I asked him, can I have a selfie? Yeah, here's our selfie. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I'll, let me just show you real quick. I, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just amazing uh, how, how kind uh, he was. And so, uh, where are we? There we are. There, you know, there, there, there we are upstairs. And uh, so my goal while living there was to figure out how I could get a selfie with Pope Francis. So I move in. And the first thing they have us do is they have us sign all this paperwork. Well, the paperwork is in Latin. I don't read Latin. Okay, I mean, I can read it. I, I don't understand it. And so, just like you do when you sign in for your rental car agreement or your hotel agreement, you don't read the agreement. Maybe some of you do. I don't. I just signed away. And there was just something saying to me, you better ask what you're signing, you know? And I said, excuse me, what am I signing? And they said, you're signing that you can take no pictures. No, that's what they said while you live here. Because not only is this the Pope's residence, but it's where he also has all his meetings. And we don't want that recorded. And I was like, well, I don't want to stay here. I mean, I didn't say that out loud. And I remember I went upstairs, I moved in. Four days later, time to begin the mission. 4.30 in the morning. I'm walking down the hall on the second floor because I have to get downstairs to get a cab to go to Rome Fumicino Airport to begin the mission. And who is walking on the opposite side at 4.30 in the morning to go down to the chapel to pray, which he does every day for four hours straight, was Pope Francis. And we met at the elevator. And I remember the first words out of his mouth United States. I was like, how did you know? I'm very shy, you know. And then he said to me in Italian, looking at his watch, he said, Dove, where? Where are you going at this time in the morning? And I said, Pope Francis, I'm going out to preach. I'm going out to be your missionary. And People, he grabbed me. I'll never forget it. He grabbed me by both shoulders. And looking straight through me, he said, pray for me. And he said it again. He said, pray for me. And then he did something that I will take to my grave. He took off that white little beanie he wears. Have you ever seen him wear it? It's called a zucchetto. And he gave it to me. And he said to me, listen, now listen how prophetic, eight years ago. Now remember, pre-COVID, he said, you take this wherever you go. And you remind all people that God is with them. That God will never abandon them. And that God's mercy is always theirs. And then he pushed the down button to the elevator. <laughs> And he and I, just the two of us, got in the elevator and the doors closed. I'll remember that very well. Those elevators are so small. The doors closed. He pushed the down button and the doors, and we, we started going down. And I, my heart went into AFib because I kind of looked up for any security cameras. 
And I said, do I do it or do I not? And I said, Pope Francis. And he said, yes. I said, can I have a selfie? And there we are at 4.30. Look at that. You can tell it's 4.30 in the morning. And then three weeks ago, selfie number 56. This is our 56th selfie together. I kind of say that's all he and I do when he sees me, you know? And then I came back to the United States and my bishop called me in. And I thought, uh-oh, he found out. And my bishop called me in and my bishop said to me, Father, how would you like to travel the world, not only as a full-time papal missionary, but a full-time evangelist for the Catholic Church. And I said, I'll do it, with one exception. And literally, I, I mean, this I just blurted out. There was no pre-planning. I had no knowledge. I said, with one exception, that I take no salary, which I haven't done in eight years, no insurance, even though I was diagnosed with kidney cancer last year. No food allowance. I go town to town, state to state, nation to nation, trusting and living off the goodness of the people I am called to serve. And I'm not taking up a collection tonight. I'm just letting you know, I could see the Detroit hair just rising. And that's what I do this morning. I was in Chicago. Tonight, I'm in Detroit. Tomorrow, Kentucky. This weekend, Vieira, Florida. After Vieira, Florida, I'm in Galveston, then Prompton, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. From New Jersey, I will go then to Charleston, South Carolina. From Charleston, South Carolina, I'm soon to go to Karachi, Pakistan. From Karachi, Pakistan, just 300 days a year, 300 days a year preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And so what I thought tonight in our short time together, because I then have to catch a flight at 8.56 or 9.56, don't worry, we'll make it. You learn very quickly, you learn very quickly when you're a missionary that you just trust that God provides. You know, I will tell you this. I'm not going to tell you the reason, but I am so relieved. You're going to learn very quickly why just you all are here. Okay? I'll tell you in a moment. But I'm just glad this room is not filled. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. So you need to know that when I travel as a papal missionary, I do not, 99% of my time, travel in my clerical collar. And the reason is, is because I travel on, I live basically on an airplane, okay? And that's where I get my downtime. That's where I recharge. And when I go on a plane in my collar, People treat me different. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to ask Father here to buy you all clerical shirts for one day and just wear them and see how people treat you. I walk on in an airplane like this. People say, oh, look, honey, there's a priest. I feel safe. And I'm like, not if you knew my driving. You wouldn't, you know. People sit up straight. And I go, I'm not a nun, okay? Just, you know, relax. People knock over their magazine. They start quoting scripture of which they have nothing about. They do. A woman last week, I had to write, said, uh, let me, uh, I really have a question about, you know, in, in the letter of Paul to the Philippians. And I'm like, no, it's, no, you mean Philippians, right? She's like, no, no. Well, I'm like, I don't know what scripture you're reading from. No, I'm just being honest with you. So I travel like this, in my hoodie. I travel in my hoodie, 
my shorts, and my sandals. So two years ago, I was traveling to speak in Melbourne, Australia. I went from Lexington to Atlanta, Atlanta to LAX, and on the same day, LAX to Melbourne, Australia. The LAX to Melbourne, Australia is 14 hours by itself. When I got to LAX, the, the ticket counter or the gate, it said Delta Airlines, Melbourne, Australia, canceled. Well, Saturday night, I'm speaking in Melbourne, Australia. I'm actually speaking in Cranbourne, Australia for 3,000 Catholics for a convention. And you know, when you travel to Australia, if you leave on a Thursday, you don't get there till Saturday morning. You miss a day because of the dime timeline. But what's interesting is when you come back, it's the same day, which makes no sense to me. But anyway, so I said to the lady at the gate, I said, what's wrong with the flight? She said, well, it's canceled. And I'm like, well, duh, <laughs> you know, why? And she said, well, mechanical issues. And I said, well, how are we going to get me to Australia? And she said, oh, well, no problem, sir. See, I was just in my hoodie and my shorts and my sandals. She said, no problem, sir. She goes, we have you booked Monday. Well, wait a minute. If I'm booked on Monday, that means I'm going to get there Wednesday, and I'm booked to come back Wednesday night. And she looks at me and says, well, it's going to be a short trip. <laughs> well, that didn't settle very well. And I lost it. I lost it. And she calmed me down, and she said, I'll put you on another airlines if you don't mind. It's called Qantas. Don't know if you've ever heard of it. So she put me in a window seat, thanks be to God. And so when I travel, as I told you, I wear my hoodie, just like that. I'll do that in a couple hours, wear my hoodie. And what's beautiful about wearing the hoodie like this is that you can't make eye contact with either person sitting next to you. Because if you travel often, if you make eye contact with someone on an airplane, you're engaged to that person. Okay? So what's beautiful, what's beautiful about the hoodie is that I can see out of the corner of my eyes and they can't see me. So I put up my hoodie and I fell asleep. The monitor said 14 hours to Melbourne. I fell asleep. I woke up rejuvenated. And I look at the monitor and it says 10 more hours to go. So what did I do? What we did here. I pulled out my rosary that I carry in my left pocket. And I started praying the rosary. And the unthinkable happens. In fact, it's a disaster. All of a sudden, someone is tapping me. So I have my hoodie. So I can see that it is the woman sitting next to me. That's awful. That's awful. It means I'm going to have to interact. It means, to be honest with you, that it's going to be nine hours of conversation. She kept tapping me. I'm praying. And I turn and I go, yes, ma'am, how can I help you? She said, excuse me, are you praying? <laughs> I'm like, it's, it's a rosary. Yes, I, I'm praying. She said, oh, sorry to dis disturb you. No problem. Put my hoodie back up. I start the, I'm still on the first decade. Hits me again. Yes, ma'am, how can I help you? Could, could I ask you to pray for me? Yes, 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 I'll pray for you. In order to do that, I'm going to have to be uninterrupted, okay, because I'm still on the first decade and I have five to go. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Don't I need to tell you what I need prayer for? No, no, you don't. No, mm -mm. no. You know why you don't? Because God's a big God. You see, God is all knowing. And if God brings you to it, God is going to see you through it. So I don't need to know. But thank you. God's got it. So I'm still praying. I'm now on the fourth bead of the first decade. Oh, yeah, I've lost it now. No, I'm serious. I, I heard up front they were groaning. That was me. I said, what? I did. She said, I really feel I need to tell you. I said, what, what do you need to tell me? She said, I've been diagnosed for the second time with stage four triple X breast cancer. And she says, I have a tumor on my sacrum and I just learned how to walk. And my heart sank. Not only for mercy for her, but in sorrow for the way that I behaved. Not only less becoming as a priest, less becoming as a human being. And what I do is I always carry in my pocket, always. Every time I'm with Pope Francis, he gives me 50 crosses. He gives me 50 of these crosses, and he entrusts me to give them to whom I feel so called to. You ask for them, you don't get it. No, seriously. It's all by the trust of the Holy Spirit. And I turned to this woman who I didn't know, and I said, Ma'am, I know you don't know me. I know I was probably pretty short with you. But I want to give you this cross blessed by Pope Francis. I'm a papal missionary. Pope Francis gave it to me. It went from his hands to my hand and now to your hand. I said, whatever you're going through, God is with you. Emmanuel. That's what I said. And she just busted out crying. She did. And I was like, oh, no. And I, she said to me, she immediately crying, she said, who are you? Who are you? And all I did, I said, my, I just said, my name is Father Jim. Didn't give her my last name. I didn't even tell her where I was going to go speak. I said, my name is Father Jim. I said, what is, who are you? And she said, my name is Olivia Newton-John. I said, who? She said, Olivia Newton-John. I said, you mean the woman from Greece? <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. She said, yes. And I just started singing. You're the one that I want. Woo -hoo. She's like, no, no, shh. We parted ways in Melbourne, Australia. I never got her information. She never got my information. We parted ways. I went two hours to go speak in Cranbourne, Australia to the 3,000 people in this beautiful cathedral church at 7 o'clock that evening. At 7.05, the doors open up. And who walks through but Olivia Newton-John and her husband, John Easterling, and they sat right over there. And the only way I knew that is because everyone on this side of the church got out their cameras and started filming because she's a mega star in Australia. 
And I waited and I waited for her to come out afterwards, and she never did. And I was so disappointed. She must have gone through a side door. And when I came back into the cathedral, you could say this was the altar, and there was the platform. The Blessed Sacrament was way up here. I came and I genuflected. And when I walked around here, who was kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament? Non-Catholic, Olivia Newton-John. Non-Catholic, her husband, John Easterling. And how do I know that? Because I was waiting to take my selfie uh, with them. And, and hold on, hold on. One second. I want to show you this because it's very, very, very important. Because what is around her neck, the cross I gave her that morning. You see, my brothers and sisters, you are the voice of God. You are the hands and the eyes of Christ. One of the greatest mistakes I find within the faithful, especially the Catholic faithful, is that we come to Mass every weekend and we receive Jesus in the Word, we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, we receive Jesus through one another, and then we're sent forth. And the question is, I'll just ask you, who today was led to Jesus by you? Not by, not by your words, but by your actions. Who saw the joy of Jesus in you? The reason why I'm so happy that there is just this amount of people is because in my prayer, I had said to myself, how am I going to distribute the remaining crosses I have from Pope Francis? That's what I kept saying to myself. And God has given me the answer. So each of you are getting the cross that Pope Francis gave me on my last visit with him. We always have to remember something. It's, it's never about numbers. It's about message. It's about grace. It's about being and planting the seed and fertilizing it and allowing it to grow. I'll share another story. I still have time. So I had the great opportunity to speak to all the members of Congress and their families. I spoke to them at the William, uh, sorry, I spoke to them at the Washington Hilton it was an amazing event. I felt so privileged. It was one of the few days that I looked presentable. You know, I mean, I really did. I, I got my hair cut at Supercuts. I went and got shoes at the Dollar General. You know, I mean, as a missionary of mercy, I, I, my one suitcase is in the back, and that's everything I have. So I was really excited about, you know, giving them the best opportunity, for they also are servant leaders. And afterwards, the Secret Service took me on a private tour of Washington. And then they dropped me off at my hotel at 4 o'clock. And when I got out of my car, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a I would say about 23-year-old homeless guy. 
And you know who he was headed after, don't you? You know who he was coming to? The priest. I could smell him before he arrived. It was obvious that he was homeless. And he came up to me and he said to me, Father, do you have any money? Nope, I don't carry money on me. Never have, never do. I only have two credit cards, a shell card, and my bishop gives me a card. That's it. Nothing else. I said, I have no money. I said, are you hungry? He said, I'm starved. I said, would you like to have dinner with me? He said, I'd love to. And I just looked across the street. There's an Italian restaurant. I'm Italian, okay? Half Italian, half Slovak, okay? My mother's name is Maria Assumpta Sarasso, okay? You can't get any more Italian than that. Born on the Assumption of Mary. So I said, look, there's an Italian restaurant. Would you like to come with me? I'd love to. So I, I'm Googling Felicia's as I'm going over. It's a five-star Italian restaurant. Five-star. The maitre d' sees me. Hey, padre, como esta? Hey, ben, hey, hey, hey. You know how we are. And he brought me in to the restaurant, and he shuts the door on the homeless man. He does. And I said, no, scusi, scusi, scusi. He, he's with me. Have you ever upset an Italian before? You know when they're upset. You know why? Their hands go everywhere. They do. Along with the dishes. And he put us outside. He made us wait outside. Ten minutes later, he came and got us. Guess where he sat us? I wish he sat us by the kitchen. That's a place of honor for an Italian. He put us in the storage closet. No joke. He put us in the storage closet. He put a cardboard table, two folding chairs, a white tablecloth with the plunger, the toilet tissue, the disinfectants. I was never more embarrassed in my life. I said, I looked at him and I said, um, just to make him feel better, I said, excuse me, who are you? Do you know how expensive it is to get a private dining room in a restaurant like this? And he ate, and he ate, and he ate, and he ate. And finally I realized something. I never asked him his name. I said, what is your name? He said, my name is Kyle, Father. I said, Kyle, let's take a selfie. Oh, he lit up. You would have thought he won the Mega Millions. He lit up. And I said, why are you, what, what, what's that reaction for? And he said to me this. He said, Father, if you want to take a selfie with me, it means that I matter to someone. I said, Kyle, what are you talking about? You do matter to someone. Most importantly, you matter to God. The same God who created you created me. Don't we pray the our father? <laughs> not just your father, not just my father, our father. God, do you realize something that you and me, Kyle, share God's DNA. We are his children. And even though you're going through difficult times, you got to realize something. God is with you. God won't abandon you. Here, here is Kyle. Look at this. See what happens when you sit in front? Hold on one second. Where is Kyle? Here he is. There he is. And can I tell you something? I've never seen Kyle again, ever. But what I can tell you is that this is the face of Jesus Christ. Because whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, 
you do to me. Never, ever forget that. The greatest commandment that God has given us is that we love our God with all our hearts, mind, and soul, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. And can I tell you something? Your neighbor ain't the person you like the best. I'll end with the last story. Then any type of questions, maybe. I don't know what time I have to leave. Uh, do you all know what time I have to leave? 8.15. Okay, well, that's not, uh, okay. Oh, yes, okay. So, so here's my last story, and that is this. So, as a papal missionary of mercy, as I told you, I'm on the road 300 days a year. So I have really no church community. Every weekend I'm in a different church. It's very fascinating to see all of the amazing ways we as church worship. And we all have our own issues in our own parishes. Trust me. I see it. And I talk about it. I confront it with the people. That's why I preach at all of the masses, so I can get a really good understanding. And then on Monday night, I give them the report card. They get all shaken up. I leave. You see, that's the beauty. I leave. I can say what I want. I leave. Just like tonight. <laughs> I can say what I want. I'm on a plane tonight. You can write Cardinal Mata. He's upstairs, okay? So... I went and I spoke in a town right outside of Houston, Texas. It was this small country town. My brothers and sisters, I am not a country boy, okay? These people came to church with like huge belt buckles, okay? Huge belt buckles. And they were proud of those belt buckles. This was a cowboy town and cowgirl town. And country people populate. Nine children, hard workers, and faithful to the church. And uh, so there's, I'm at mass, all these farmers, calluses on the hands, young and old. They all had their hats next to them. In the front pew here was a family of nine children and the mom and dad. Well, the pastor who's overseeing this parish gets sick with COVID. So guess what? I get a call from the local diocesan bishop and says, since you're there till Wednesday, can you cover the parish for any emergencies? Of course I can. I said, but Bishop, I just want you to know, all I have is, you know, my hoodie and my sandals and my shorts. And I said, I also have my clerics, you know. And he said, no problem. We just need you to be on standby. Monday morning, 10 a.m., I get a call from the parish secretary. That family of nine their father, who was 51, had a medical issue out in the field, the pasture. And they needed the priest there. So I just put on my hoodie, my shorts, my sandals. I've never been out to a pasture before. Let me tell you, you don't wear sandals, okay? I'm just giving you a heads up if you're ever headed to the pasture, okay? I mean, I was jumping over stuff. I was running out to the middle of the pasture. Can I tell you, these huge animals, these cows, these steers, they were just, you know, if I could think what they were thinking, they were saying, you don't belong here. <laughs> don't even act like you belong here. And behind me were the ambulance workers 
running with the backboard and the paddles and all this stuff. And we get there, and there are the nine children and the wife, and he's dead. Dead. I, I, I was just, just taken back. Well, the priest has COVID. I'm leaving Wednesday. They said, Father, would you do the funeral? We'll bury him by Wednesday. I said, I'll, I'll, I'm, no problem, I'll, I'll do it. My brothers and sisters, let me tell you, I've never done a funeral for country folk before. I mean, they came in boots. I don't know if you've ever heard of this organization, but most of the people there wore these blue jean jackets called FFA. Do you know what that stands for? Future, what? Yeah, how do you know that? Oh, yeah, that's what it is, Future Farmers of America. I guess they're all over. And I remember the two youngest children saying about how the one thing they were going to miss about their father is that next week he was supposed to take them to auction. Because what they do in FFA is they grow these animals. I don't know if grow is the right word, but they... Thank you so much, Father. Yes. <laughs> they raise these animals, and then they bring them to auction, and the money raised in auction goes to get them to college for tuition. And I heard that. And there was the Holy Spirit speaking. There it was. You have to help this family out some way and I'm like no I don't have to help this family out no you see my brothers and sisters here's a great question for you to take home tonight here's your homework what does the sound of God's voice sound like in your life the way God speaks to me is not the way God speaks to you and if you don't know the sound of God's voice in your life, you're in spiritual turmoil. You see, I trust the voice of God. Why do I trust? Because I spend time with God. I have a relationship with God. I have an understanding of how God works in my life. I surrender myself to God's will and not I surrender God to God's will and not my will, and I make the effort. I try. T-R-U-S-T. -T. So I left on Wednesday after the funeral, and I researched FFA. I found their central office for the state of Texas is in Austin. And the event that these kids were going to was a national event called the Houston Livestock Rodeo. So I called FFA and I said, I want to help these children out. They said, well, Father, their steers are going to auction on Saturday morning. And if you want, we'll give you a number. We'll have them call you, you know, the auctioneer people, and you can participate in the auction." Well, my brother says, I've never done an auction in my life. That's the only auction I've ever done. Let me tell you what, auctions are wild, especially on the phone. So I said, okay, I'll do it. They said, what's your credit? I only have, you know, I don't have a credit card for this. They said, that's okay. We trust you. You can write a check. I said, okay. So they said, here comes father. Here comes the first Hughes steer, okay? That's the name of the family. Uh, and it was the kids. Here, uh, they sent me a picture of it, just so you can see uh, that there were these steer. There, there, look, look at that, there, there, there it is. Okay, big old thing, yeah, okay? So the auctioneer starts. 
And you can hear in the background, blah, 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 three, blah, 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 four. I'm like, how much are we at? $400? What are we at? They said, four cents. I said, four cents? I said, you all should be ashamed of yourself. Five dollars. Five dollars. And he and the, he went, excuse me? I said, five dollars. Let's go. Let's go. And he screams out, five dollars on the phone. Went silent. Went silent. He said, five dollars on the phone, going once, five dollars on the phone, sold five dollars. I said, oh, wow. I said, he said, Father, you bought the cat. I said, thanks be to God. I said, you know, you people are cheap. These kids have worked. So they brought in the second one. There it is right there. Second one. They said, let's go. We're about to go, Father. You ready? Let's go. I said, they said, are you ready? Are you ready? I said, yes. I said, I'm making the first call. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Quiet. Sold. I said, they said, Father, thank you very much. I said, no, thank you. They said, Father, because of your generosity, they said, because of your generosity, we are going to waive the processing fee. I don't even know what processing means, okay? I said, well, look, I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to send one of the steers to my sister in Orange, Texas and put it in her backyard just as a joke. We have a little fenced in yard. And I said, I want you to send the other one to, um, my, uh, to the family and let them know that my sympathies and condolences are with them and their family, that they can have their pet back, you know. So I wrote them two checks, $5, $10, sent it to Texas, you know, FFA, went on about my business. A month later, I get a phone call from my bishop. My bishop, he's on the phone with the CFO of the diocese. Now, my brothers and sisters, I don't know, I don't want to insult any of you who are like CPAs and money people, but you know, you all think differently than I, okay? I, I'm, I'm a more creative, spontaneous individual, okay? And uh, the bishop has the, the CFO on the line, and the bishop goes, um, Father, um, were, were you in Houston at the Livestock Rodeo recently? I said, oh, Bishop, how'd you know? I said, yes, I was. I said, you'll never believe this. He goes, no, I bet I will. <laughs> I said, no, no, you got to remember something. My bishop is Franciscan. My bishop is a Franciscan. He understands poor, marginalized. I said, yeah. I said, no, I was. I said, bishop, uh, I bought two cattle for $15, and that is going to help education. And the CFO chimes in, $15, I don't think so. I said, Oh, yes, ma'am, $15. I said, I'll tell you what check numbers they were because I wrote one for five and the other for 10. The bishop goes, um, Father, <clears throat> that was uh, $5 a pound. He said, the first one was 1,275 pounds. And the second one you bought at $10 a pound, which was 1,250 pounds. <laughs> and the CFO says, yes, and when are we expecting the 15,000? I said, oh, well, I'm sure God will provide. <laughs> no, no, we, I need to know when we're getting the money. And the bishop was like, relax. Let Father think about this, and he'll get back with us. So I posted this. I posted this on social media. I've done some crazy missionary of mercy ministry, but this was a new one for me. Last week, I buried the father of these two, nine children. Today, I find out that I purchased their steers at auction for over $15,000. I know God will provide. So I just posted that. That evening, I get a phone call from a man named Ed Bastion. 
Ed Bastian. Do you know who he is? He's the CEO of Delta. Well, my brothers and sisters, I want to let you know something. Every time I fly, including tonight, I give all the flight attendants gift cards every time I fly. Gift cards, and I give the pilots gift cards. And we take selfies, and I post it. And Mr. Bastion, Mr. Bastion heard about me. And he called me up. And he said, I'd like to know how we can help you. I said, $15,000 can help me. <laughs> That's what I said. That's what I said. $15,000 can help me. And he said, I read about that. And he said, we'll have the check to you tonight. A through ACH. And he said, how about this? How about if we fly the family up there and you distribute the processed meat to the poor? If anything you take away tonight is you take away mercy. You take away the whole aspect of when you give you receive, you take away the whole aspect that we're all called, all called by God because he is our father. I'm going to head, I'll, I'll pass out these for you today, and I know I have just enough, and once again, the miracle and trust of Jesus. Good? Father, yes. before you go, okay. if Paul Harvey was here, yes. he would say the rest of the story. So Olivia Newton-John passed on August 6, 2022. Her family owned a vineyard, I believe, in California. And in September, they had a celebration for her life. John Travolta... Donnie and Marie, it was a who's who of Hollywood. Did you ever hear anything about it? I was there. I was asked to come because uh, Olivia, uh, you know, accepted Jesus and became Catholic. And together we, we spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So they're, they're very, they're still very close family. She was buried with her cross. And that's the beautiful thing. God. And that's the rest of the story. <laughs> so while well, Father's passing out the beautiful crosses, and thank you for the, for the cross. And, you know, it is true. Um, there's a reason why things happen, and I'm so grateful that Tonight we get a special gift because it's uh, it's us, right? The Lord is wanting to bless just us, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, Jack, are we going to take up our free will offering? No, not for me. No, not well. Jack's got to pay for this room, so uh, we want to we want to do that. So if we wouldn't mind uh, just passing the basket, and again, you know, it's it's one of those things where it, this is not run by the diocese. Uh, uh, the ministry here that, that runs the, the, the speaker series is run on your donations. And so we thank you, plus the donations of those who are our sponsors. And I just want to mention uh, those sponsors. Uh, Ave Maria Mutual Funds. Um, these are long-term investors who want to invest in accordance with our pro-life and Catholic identity. And so their criteria for their no-load mutual funds are overseen by uh, an independent Catholic advisory board. So they're there to help. Of course, you've heard of Ave Maria Radio. It's a beacon of hope and inspiration. It can be heard on 990 AM, 105.5 FM, and 107.9 FM, or on your app. So together we can build the church and bless the nation. Uh, Catholic Funeral Cemetery Services. The Catholic Funeral and Cemetery Services of the Archdiocese of Detroit is a charitable organization founded in faith and dedicated to providing education, support, and professional services. The mission is to guide and give you wisdom on end-of-life issues. 
I don't know if Father's ever heard of corporate travel before, but since 1965, corporate travel has served the educational, faith, music, and culture, leisure, travel markets with best-in-class tours, events, and programming. Also, we have a new sponsor. You guys ever heard of Chicken Shack? Yeah, so they're sponsoring us now, uh, and they're making this possible. So they were founded in 1956 by John and Iola Sobek. Iola is still with us, um, and they've been the we've been the beneficiaries of the best roasted chicken in America ever since. Uh, led by Iola, who is 96 years old, uh, she was on Jack's uh, program a while back. She told him what what for I think yeah she she always does, uh, and she says um, she says they're more than just a restaurant or food they're a family yours and mine, and the community uh, their community is with over 200 plus employees and 23 stores. We have Life Partners Foundation, their Pro Life Partners Foundation helps pro life organizations, schools, communities to protect the preborn children and to end abortion and to heal the nation. It exists to be the wind beneath the wings of the pro-life movement. Their mission is to end abortion, to advance a culture of life from the conception, from con conception to natural death. And of course, we have the Robert E. Burke Memorial Trust Foundation. Uh, Father Burke um, uh, was the longtime pastor of Holy Family Parish in Birmingham, Holy Name Parish in Birmingham, before he passed away in 2003, he put, in a pl place, put into place a foundation for the evangelization of Catholics. The foundation is pleased to be able to partner with AIP, this group, um, in the speaker series, in an effort to proactively engage the laity in building and maintaining the faith community. They bring to Detroit many inspiring, nationally known uh, Catholics and their leaders. And also, uh, today, the sound system and the audio and visual are provided by Russell Sumner Blue World uh, Productions. And we want to thank St. John's Resort for helping us. Uh, next season, or next uh, season three, uh, next uh, speaker are the uh, Rennie and Esther, it's Pastor Rennie and Esther Kaufman, and they provide for us a concert. And so please join us, um, where's the date, Jack? December 19th, 2023. If you want to get this and all our programs uh, again, if you want to see it, take note on what uh, Father said tonight. Uh, you can watch or listen to our speakers at, at AIP Speaker Series on the YouTube channel. And uh, Jack, do we have carrot cake? We do. We have more than enough carrot cake for everybody. So please join us in the uh, Afterglow Room uh, for some cake and some refreshments. Jack, anything we else? Got it. We, I want to ask you a question, uh -oh. okay? You recently went, up, went on a pilgrimage. Yeah. To where? And talk about that experience if you would. Sure. Um, I took, uh, I was part of a pilgrimage experience. We took about 90 individuals um, to Lourdes, to Garabandal, and to Fatima. Uh, Lourdes and Fatima, of course, are very well known. The church has accepted them. Um, we're still waiting for the church's ruling on Garabandal, where the Blessed Mother appeared to four children. Um, it's in, Portu it's in um, Spain, and it's just near Portugal. Uh, the, the, the beauty of this trip was that we got to learn about the Blessed Mother. We prayed. We brought a lot of petitions. I even have a, a I can't show you a selfie. But I have on my my my, my phone. Uh, we bought a huge candle. So many people gave us all these beautiful uh, petitions, and you know, pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. And I wasn't sure what to do. Well, you know, in Lords, you're able to take and buy these huge candles. They're bigger than Easter candles. It was this tall and about this wide, and we couldn't even carry it. It was so huge. And we had it on a dolly, and we just rolled it right through uh, all of uh, the, the Lord's Plaza and into these, um, these almost like little um, farms, not farms, uh, sheds. And they had uh, these candle burning areas. And so we were able to set it up, and we all prayed all our petitions on that candle. And uh, it was lit uh, three and a half weeks ago, and it's going to be burning for another three and a half weeks. So it's a huge candle for their petitions. Uh, one of the graces, this is kind of difficult, uh, one of the graces was while we were in Garibandel, 
which is the most remote part of our trip, uh, a man passed away on our pilgrimage. And his wife, at first, were like, what do we do? You know, he had a heart attack. We tried to revive him. We even had a doctor who was a deacon trying to resuscitate him. And he kept doing compressions and all the way to the hospital. But he wound up dying anyway. And so we said, you know, we're trying to comfort her. And uh, we don't know what to do. And, 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 and we said, you know, well, what are you going to do? She goes, well, I don't know, but you are all my family now. Like 90 people were being asked to be her family in this difficult time. She stayed with us the entire pilgrimage. That was, the, that was right in the middle, so we had finished seven days. We had seven more to go. She stayed with us for seven days because she thought, if I go home, I'm just going to lose my mind. I'm going to worry about everything. I'm, I'm going to stay with this pilgrim group. I'm going to get prayed up, and then we'll go home and we'll bury my husband. So the pilgrim, uh, pilgrimage was uh, not just a time of, of growing in faith, but really, like Father said, being there for each other, taking care of one another, like leaning in and, and not letting someone's need go unnoticed and uncared for and unloved. I can't believe he, he reached out to a, a homeless person. Is it Kyle, he said, right? Um, and, and just <laughs> fed him in a closet, right? Um, what a beautiful gift and what a beautiful gesture of, of God's mercy and love. Um, yeah, and you, how, many, how many of you have been on pilgrimage before? Have you ever taken a pilgrimage? Okay, several of you. I think it's one of the most important things to do as a Catholic, to learn how to be a pilgrim. Because it's not like going on vacation, right? Um, there were a couple difficulties. We had to spend a couple, three days of our pilgrimage were spent on a bus for seven hours. That's a long time. And, you know, we had, uh, uh, you know, bus stop food, right? And a bus stop coffee, which is not that great. And um, we started to complain a little bit. And then we just were reminded, imagine if we were like 100 years ago making this pilgrimage, right? Or maybe, you know, 4,000 or 2,000 years ago pilgriming to Jerusalem, be very different, wouldn't it? And so we started appreciating all the hardships and giving them over to the Lord and letting the Lord teach us through that. Uh, but it was a beautiful experience of the Blessed Mother's love, um, how she cares for us. And just one last thing, I, I think we looked at Fatima, we looked at Lourdes, um, but then we started pulling together a lot of these other, you know, um, beautiful gifts that were being given to, through the saints. and. Faustina, uh, Padre Pio, all of them are pointing to our time that it's a very special time to prepare for Jesus' return. I'm not saying he's coming back tomorrow. I'm not saying he's coming back in 100 years. But it seems like each one of these saints and these apparitions point to us preparing the world to receive Jesus again. Even, even in Faustina's diary, she said... Um, I'm sending a spark that will light the way for my second coming. Jesus told that to St. Faustina. I'm sending a spark from Poland that will prepare the way for my second coming. Who do you think that was? John Paul. And it was divine mercy. What did Father speak about tonight? Mercy. So it's so very important that in our day, we proclaim mercy to everybody as much as we can, as often as we can. Because um, I think the world is, is just needing, look at, look at Israel right now, and look at uh, Palestine. We could, they could use a whole lot of mercy, couldn't they? And so our prayers go out to them and to the whole world, and to invite them to accept the mercy of Jesus, and to seek that forgiveness and that love that leads to mercy. All right. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for One preparing a beautiful night. Yes. One more thing. This is dangerous. When Jack has a microphone, it's very dangerous. <laughs> So as most of you know, I've had a radio show for 19 years on WJR entitled With God Anything is Possible. And that's how I met Father Jim Shisko through his cousin, Joe Bion. <laughs> well, a day or two ago, the show was with Josh Spears and his wife, Julie, and three sons, Successful businessman, salesman, and eight months ago, he's on a Zoom call at work, at home. 
And he tells the people on the call, I, I, I don't feel good, I have to call 911. He doesn't remember doing that, and he was having an aortic dissection. Ooh. One percent of the people that have that make it to an operating table. Wow. One percent. Forty percent of the one percent, Joe, live after the operating table. And seven weeks later, this man walked out of the hospital. All the doctors, nurses, therapists say he's a living miracle, a yeah. walking miracle. So before, you, before we say a prayer for Josh, Julie, and the family, Josh, w say a couple words. A couple words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jack. I appreciate, I appreciate the privilege of being on your show um, to share, share my story. Hopefully it, it lifts people up. But just so we know, just a reminder that Christ is real. Uh, yeah. He lives in all of us, and he has a plan for all of us. Sometimes we need to be reminded of how big and how powerful God is. And God used the OLGC community and all my brothers and sisters in Christ to show me how big and powerful he is. So um, if you are up against it, just know that he is real, and he's got a plan for you, and he will deliver you, whatever you're going through. Amen. And yeah, you know, Jack, your program, Anything is Possible, right? Uh, there was a huge, almost like a mountain in Garibandal that we had to climb. And I am also part of the heart attack, heart failure, heart craziness club. And a year ago I had a heart attack and my heart was down to 11% function. And they were going to put a heart transplant in me. Um, but I got prayed over. Uh, there was a, my, my, my surgeon got COVID and couldn't operate, so in that little two-week period, I went and got prayed over. My heart went from a, a low of 11% to a high of 46%. And I got off the transplant list, and they just did open-heart surgery. But what I'm saying is, on this pilgrimage, I was able to climb every mountain. I was able to go up every, you know, wherever I needed to go. Uh, I kept up with everybody. And the Lord is good. And, and Jesus Christ is real. And his, his Holy Spirit and his healing is real. So, yeah, I agree with you 100%, Josh. What a great story. All right, everybody, thank you very much. Let's close with a very simple prayer. Uh, let's ask for the intercession of St. Albert the Great to give us um, his blessing, his encouragement, because he was, he was so in love with knowledge and with science and, and with philosophy and with all those good things that, that, that our, our, our minds want to know, but he was also filled with the grace to love Jesus in his heart. So we ask, Lord Jesus, that you come and be with us and that we, you remain with us wherever we may go, uh, to our homes, to our families. And Lord, we ask you to inspire us to be more like Jesus, your son, Father, to be more like Jesus, your son, so that we can tell others about the great gift of our faith. And Blessed Mother, wrap your mantle around each and every one of us, keep us free from distraction, and help us to love Jesus, your son, as you do. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God. Awesome. Have a good night.